So we all have our mental maps about what innovation is. Just like you know, these uh, uh, explorers back in the 17th century had a map of California that showed it as being an island off the coast of North America. Now, I live in San Francisco now, and some people think that, San, uh, that California is an island off the coast of America, at least culturally, but that's another story. But the point is that if you look at the language that's being applied to innovation these days, there's a lot of flavors. You know, it's not quite Howard Johnson's 21 flavors, but it's getting pretty close. So you have reverse innovation, which is where things are created in the emerging economies and then filter up to the first world. There's open source, there's uh, digital innovation, a lot of work going on in digital nervous systems for innovation. You know, the Samsung uh, innovation system that you referenced, uh, a big part of that was actually developed by a friend of mine who's a chief designer at BMW. And it is a digital nervous system, almost like a digital democracy system for participating in uh, innovation processes enabled by the internet. Large scale, you can blame me for that term, so I believe that it's important to look at innovation as a societal function, not just as an enterprise function. So much of the literature on innovation is about companies, which is fine, but I, you know, I, I've done 10 strategy studies for countries, Finland, Canada, Abu Dhabi, um, uh, Australia, you, you name it, right? And so this notion of the country as the unit of analysis I think is very important. Then there's a whole set of uh, new disciplines coming out of the field of design. You know, how do you get users to be the uh, catalyst for thinking about innovation? Indigenous innovation, this is China's word for uh, innovation at a policy level, and China has pushed $500 billion of trade surplus money into their national innovation agenda. They're very serious about it. Sustainability innovation. So this is interesting for you as a, um, a profitably sustainable um, community, a business model. Nike uh, had an innovation team and a sustainability team and they decided to merge them together. So they don't speak about one or the other, they speak about them in one breath. And frugal innovation or Gandhian innovation is uh, a term invented by a colleague of mine, uh, Ramesh Mishelkar, the former Minister of Science and Technology of India, to talk about how innovation can actually drive towards simplicity and cost effectiveness, not just, you know, a green iPhone 7, right, which is, you know, another vector for, for innovation. Okay. So let's get a few terms straight. Creativity is the ability to generate something new, but new doesn't mean valuable. You know, um, uh, imagination is about forming new images and thoughts, but it doesn't mean they're valuable. So, you know, I can pour paint all over the floor here and it'll be creative, but it will actually be destructive of value, at least in the opinion of the hotel, and they'll probably make me want to clean up the mess. But if my name is Jackson Pollock and I make this drip on the rug, maybe the hotel will want to pay me $20 million to cut out the rug and hang it on the wall because it'll be a famous Jackson Pollock splatter painting. So creativity is a necessary but not sufficient condition for, for innovation. Innovation, the dictionary, would define as creativity applied to some purpose to realize value. Creativity applied to a purpose to realize value. And this is different also from invention. So, you know, Michael showed the slide of Thomas Edison, a star inventor, right? He was, when he got the first light bulb going, he was an inventor. But it wasn't until he started selling lots of light bulbs that he was an innovator. So an innovation has to change something about the existing order of things. It has to be adopted. It has to come home or it's something new, it's invention, it's, but it's not innovation. Now, people are always, and sorry if this is too semantic, but this is really important stuff because people use language loosely and it always bothers me tremendously because it means that communication is impossible. Okay? To me, entrepreneurship is relevant, but it's different from innovation, so it's like a cousin, a first cousin. So in entrepreneurship is the ability to make things happen, to pursue opportunities you know, without necessarily controlling a lot of resources. So, you know, entrepreneurs are people who drive ideas towards realization, but, you know, you could be a, an entrepreneur who owns 10 McDonald's franchises. That's really good. You know, you make three, four, five million dollars a year. Congratulations. 
but there's nothing particularly creative about it, right? So you can have entrepreneurship without creativity. Um, and I like to look at innovation as being about purpose, as, as being about something. So to me, innovation is a set of capabilities, remember the piano demo, capabilities that enable the continuous realization of a desired future. What does that mean? It means there has to be something you want, whether it's for you individually or for your company or for your country, that motivates you to do the work of innovation. Because otherwise, why bother? It's not because, you know, some management expert says it's a good thing, you better eat your spinach. It had, there has to be a reason. There has to be a purpose that motivates you and also your people so they get out of bed earlier and they want to get to work and they want to make this thing happen. Otherwise, you know, we're just talking about an abstraction once again. Innovation is also complicated to talk about because it operates at various levels. You have individuals who are innovative, you have teams that are innovative, you have companies that are innovative, and you have geographies that are innovative. So think about that for a second. It's psychology, interpersonal behavior, organizational theory, political theory, you know, government policy. All of these disciplines are uh, embedded, in a sense, in our requirement to understand how innovation works. You can't understand Apple Computer, for example, without incorporating all of those elements. Because, you know, Steve Jobs' personality, the dynamics of the key team, which are pretty rocky right now, the organizational culture, and Silicon Valley are all relevant levels of understanding. It's also complicated because, you know, I would argue, and I've written elsewhere, that there have been at least three eras of economic history in which innovation's been really important. So, it, you know, we start off with innovation in the industrial era, where you have um, economies of scale, somebody invents a production process, you have learning curve effects, you know, sort of the, the whole kind of model of mass production. But then you have Silicon Valley. You have the killer app, venture capital, uh, disruptive innovation, entrepreneurship model, which everyone um, uh, is quite interested in. You know, there, it seems like there's a delegation, international delegation, almost every day visiting Silicon Valley and trying to figure out what the secret sauce is. And then there's what you might call human-centered innovation, which is something that's really making its appearance over this decade, which is user-centered design, which is big data, which is um, uh, new kinds of services, innovation arbitrage. So the whole idea that instead of innovation coming from an abstraction like uh, microprocessor you know, development landscapes, it comes from answering more basic questions like, how would you improve mass transit in Bogota, Colombia? Or you know, what you, could you do to make a $600 EKG machine that would be usable in a rural village in India? or how do you do new packaging for baby boomers, right? I mean, sort of answering a question for somebody as opposed to starting with a technology abstraction or a business model abstraction. And that's very much what's going on these days is putting the human being at the center of the innovation process. Okay, and the other point is that innovation can be about many things. You know, it's tempting to think about it as new product development. And there's a very mature and, and to me, somewhat misleading literature about product development, product development funnel, filters, even a lot of the digital tools are very much about a point of view of what innovation is. So it's about science and technology. It's about talent. It's about processes, how you do things. It's about products. It's about ways of seeing things. It's about business models. It's about sensing emerging opportunities. It's about customers. It's about a lot of things, right? And we have to get our minds, I think, around a much broader landscape within which this notion of innovation, or if you prefer, just changing things to create value and to deal with the changes that are coming at you um, becomes a skill set. Okay, so one down, two to go. The second question I want to address is why innovation is important. Um, Michael covered some of that in his talk, but I think it's important to make the point that if this were a stable era of history, we wouldn't be talking so much about innovation. We would be talking about efficiency and execution. But, you know, this is a period of history where all bets are off. You know, mo existing models are up for question, and it's back to this Hiroshige drawing, 19th century, where the great wave disrupts uh, the boat, these little people are powerful, powerless to guide its progress. Mount Fuji, the cultural center of Japan, is off to the side. So the universe is just out of whack, right? And so um, 
the elements of that today are clearly obvious. You know, the whole notion of uh, reset. You know, Jeff Immel says this is an era of reset. Existing business models no longer work. Um, this is an era of uh, a dramatic rise in complexity on all levels, right? More information, big data, technological acceleration, uh, um, you know, we, the more we know, the more complicated things become, in a way. Um, the cost, meanwhile, the cost structure of innovation is decreasing in many areas. So, you know, these guys, this is the movie, but, you know, this is what Facebook looked like at its inception, right? A dorm room and a few computers. So the barriers to entry for innovation in many sectors is incredibly low, right? Which means lots more players, which means lots more competition. Actually, which means that incumbent companies, which are not likely to hire teenagers and give them, you know, potato chips and let them sit in a dorm room and do whatever they want, which was kind of the, the environment out of which this innovation occurred, um, you know, they're not likely to do that. So where are they at in terms of this uh, kind of innovation race? And then also, increasingly, the rewards go to agile organizations that are able to, you know, not try to create permanent edifices, but are celebrating what is temporary. So um, this is a very interesting architectural structure from Japan called the Issei Shrine, which every 10 years is disassembled to its component parts and then reassembled. Now think about that. I mean, you know, would you go to the Tetra Pak headquarters and disassemble it down to the bricks and move it somewhere else, like to, you know, uh, um, you know from, from Malmo to Stockholm or, you know, to another country and, and reassemble it? Maybe not. But if you did that, what would you learn? And what would happen in terms of your perception of uh, permanence versus uh, uh, agility and flexibility? And it goes to something Eric Schmidt, the, uh, the former CEO of Google, said to me once, which is, Google is nothing more or less than a bag of projects, right? So very agile, very, very temporary, right? The organization is kind of a service platform for innovation projects, pretty interesting, right? So disruption can also mean opportunity. It's not all bad. You know, I mean, how, uh, does anybody recognize this building here? The Bilbao, um, uh, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. So the story of this is pretty amazing, right? I mean, the, this guy comes in and, you know, says, uh, you know, I, I have the answer to Bilbao's decline as a city, uh, and it's only going to cost $100 million. And people say, OK, well, we're willing to bet $100 million. And then they say, what do you want? to do with it. And he says, well, you know, I'm going to hire this architect in LA and um, he's going to build us this building and it's going to look like kind of a ship, but not really. And, uh, and about $40 million of the hundred is going to be for titanium sheets that are going to wrinkle as soon as they're exposed to air. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, but we need another 50 million. Well, what's that for? Well, it's for art, you know, like we're going to have this 30 foot high iron sculpture of a spider, you know, Louise Bourgeois. Isn't that wonderful? And so by this time, if you're a traditional, you know, money guy, like a CFO of the city, you're probably ready to fire this person. But instead, they did it, right? And now there's a million visitors a year to Bilbao, uh, times several thousand euros per visit, let's say. You know, big, big bucks, right? I mean, the, whole, the river's clean, the uh, architecture is flourished. It's become an innovation hotspot on a global basis. And, um, what is out of the box in terms of an innovation that was not obvious has become the game changer for the city. So disruption can equal opportunity as well.